Hey, welcome back. Today on my bench I got a Harman Kardon HK460i, which I picked up locally. Paid a good price for it. Um, you know, the, the usual story. The owner wants to get rid of it. Price is low. But uh, I picked it up. I don't know its condition. It, it's, it looks really good. Like it's dirty, but it, it's, you know, it's very nice. Uh, it's not damaged. It's, it's not scratched up. Nothing's missing, uh, except for two two case screws, cabinet cover screws, which I am, uh, these ones here are all mashed like they're stripped. So somebody's been in and out of here like, uh, oh, I won't say it, but somebody's been in and out of there a lot. But uh, let's turn it on, try it out. I haven't tried it yet. Let's try FM. And, uh, oh, we got to plug it in before we do anything. Oh yeah, look at the power plug. It's got a big marshmallow on the end. We'll have to get a new power cord for this thing. I don't even know if that's right, wired in the right way or not. Uh, who knows. But we'll just plug it in. And hope it doesn't go up in a puff. There we go. Wow, we got lights. I don't know what all that scratchiness was. Interference, I guess. Plus, your advent here. Final day of Leon's Boxing Week is back sale. Fighting. Same day deals throughout the showroom on furniture, mattresses, and. Leon's got CA for detail. That's messed up. We have a few things to watch out for as you make your way out the door this afternoon. A collision causing delays 30 Looks like it's uh, dirty, dirty buttons for sure. A single lane. There's actually a traffic backing up past Millwood. Trouble with caution here. Also getting word of a collision at the intersection of 109th Street and 111th Avenue involving a couple vehicles. Obviously clean. In all directions. Get 20 times the points this Friday, this Sunday at Shoppers Drug. I'm only on the right channel right now. I'm the left channel is missing. Unless I go. On Chuck at 92.5. This Chuck load of songs has no yeah, where the Zoom meeting mute button is. So you're about to hear everything. Chuck at 92.5. 80s. 90s. Everything. It seems to be doing okay. A proud supporter of. We have to do some uh, cleaning here. These switches, these ones are. Working good. Ma'am? Does have a built in antenna. A distortion. Dirty switches. Yeah, dirty switches. Okay, so let's open it up, have a look inside. All right, screws are out. Looks clean. Everything looks all right. A little dusty inside. I don't see any evidence of anybody tinkering around inside here. Maybe they were out changing bulbs or something, but all the lights are working. All the fuses are intact. It doesn't look like anything's touched anything. Um, yeah, it looks pretty good. Might have a couple of caps back in this corner here behind, behind the power supply that it's, it's questionable. I'll test them all. 
the board for the the switches, the function switches. And you can see the the board here. And the solder connections look good on all these switches. So it doesn't look like an issue. Looks like it just needs a good cleaning and maybe a few caps. We'll go through and check them all and uh, we'll see what this thing needs. It's a little tiny 4700 microfarad capacitors here in the power supply. I don't know what this thing's rated for. I have to check the specs on it. But it looks good. I think the first step I'll take it out and blow the dust out of her. One quick check for um, your power amplifier. See if you have DC offset. Just to select a dead channel like auxiliary. And just hit the, power, uh, the speaker button. If you hear any DC, you'll hear that that click or that thump in the speakers. But this is dead silent, so I'm pretty pretty confident there's no DC on the output. That's good. That's good. There is adjustments for a DC offset on this amplifier. It's got bias and and uh, DC offset, but uh, everything looks good. Just dirty switches. Okay, let's get to work. Okay, so I've been going through with my ESR meter and testing capacitors. I'm not finding anything. I'm not finding anything wrong with any of the caps in this unit. It's not a very old unit, I don't think. What is the date on this? Let's see any date codes. Uh, let's see here. Might be, I don't know. Nothing on the back. But um, yeah, I'm checking capacitors and I'm kind of concerned about this phono board here. It's got conductive glue all over it. So I might just remove this whole board and uh, clean it out properly because I can't get in there with picks and tools. So I'll do that. I'll remove that board, clean it, and I'll check all the ESR on these two as well because I can't get in there with my probes. This, um, well, this cord is going to get changed, obviously, so I'll be uh, putting that on. But uh, for right now, I'm only seeing, technically, what's wrong with it is cold solder joints, and I'm getting a lot of them in this heat area here. There's a heat area here, and there's lots of cracks. Um, the power amplifier, I'm getting cracks on... Uh, some of these transistors so I'll touch all those up I'll look over the tuner yet I haven't looked at that yet really carefully I just want to point out look at all the bodges on this thing it's an embarrassment you got cap 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 resistor resistor diode resistor 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 jumper wire um, even down here we got on the transistors I don't know if this is part of the schematic. It's got a fairy bead in a 100 ohm resistor or 10 ohm resistor. Yeah, 10 ohm resistor in, in uh, parallel with that fairy bead. Another cap, another cap. You know, it's just, uh, I've never seen so many bodges on a Harman Kardon piece of equipment before. This is kind of a new thing for me. So uh, Another thing I ran into is um, what's on here doesn't match the schematic. I pulled a couple of uh, capacitors, the only two that I did find bad. Where are they? You can see one right here, and it's right in the middle of the heat sink, and it had a high ESR. So I replaced this one and then the other one in the other channel. These are 0.1 microfarad caps, but um, they're non critical, and it's not in the signal pass. So, um, Okay, so let's get busy on doing some soldering here. I wanted to clean this up because it was quite a mess. Another thing I'm not happy about is the length of these um, leads that they didn't cut off.
Be time to clean my tip here pretty soon. I'll get through this first. So I'll go through and resolder this, and then I'll uh, power cord. I'll replace this afternoon if it comes in in time. I ordered a bunch of new ones. I was getting. I might have a used one here. I probably do, but I'll put a brand new one on. And then uh, other than that, there's not much to talk about with this receiver. It seems to be working good. I, well, I still have to clean these switches. I'll get to that. I have to remove the front panel and everything. It's going to be a big job, so I'll do that. But bear with me. All right, so here's the phono preamp removed. Um, not much going on here. I checked the ESR on all these caps are good. I mean, I'm not going to touch them. Uh, but I do have a lot of circuit glue on here. You can see it. It's all over the place. The um, thing about circuit glue is this stuff here now hasn't gone conductive yet because it's still that elastic but when it gets hard and dry and brown then it goes conductive and corrosive so you want to dig in there and remove it from um, at least wherever it contacts the leads of a component see like in this where they had it across the bottom I got it out now but here this is eventually going to short this capacitor out or can cause leakage in this capacitor which will affect the circuit so what I'll do is just clean this out just like that now we got conductive glue on these just to hold these trans um, capacitors from flapping in the wind that's fine that's not going to do anything that's not going to short anything out it's just there to hold it but where we have it on the leads like this it's got to come out because eventually it'll go conductive and corrosive and you'll see if you have enough if you have enough potential voltage across the leads of the component you'll see that they start to corrode and uh, turn green with corrosion and usually by that point you're looking at a, a failure because the lead is going to break or just eat away and then lose con connection so we just got to get in there and dig this stuff out So I'll work on that. I got a few more here to clean out. And surprisingly, I found a little bit more of this stuff on the receiver itself. Um, it wasn't too bad. I dug it out in a few spots and uh, cleaned it up. So that's all done. It seems like the most of it's on this phono preamp. Just want to re dig it out before it causes any damage around the, the big caps here they usually put it around the base of the big caps that's not a problem because it's not shorting out any pins on any components it usually doesn't creep down underneath usually I'm gonna say that but um, for example this one here this cap was not seated properly and they put the glue on so it, the glue went underneath the cap on this side but this side I can see the lead um, I can see the lead and there's no glue touching it so I'm gonna leave that alone if it's just touching one lead it's not a big deal because there's no current place for the current to flow same with these ones on these Elna caps here they just have it along the bottom all right so I'll finish this up and I'll put it back in looks like I ran into another problem So we'll have to get that fixed up as well. All right, so I bought some uh, new cords. This is one of them. It is brand new, but it doesn't have much weight to it. Like it's pretty light duty. Let's check this out. Supposed to be six feet. Um, probably by the time I get this installed here, I'll probably lose about good eight inches or so. So it'd probably be about a five footer once I get it out. You see the end on it? It looks kind of flimsy. I'm not 
overly impressed with these cords. This is a uh, 18 gauge. This one's stamped uh, 18 gauge AWG to conductor 0.824 millimeters squared. Good for 300 volts, CSA approved. Uh, all the good stuff's there. It'll work. It's just it feels well. Actually, it's pretty comparable to what was there. So this would make a good replacement. See, you got the ends already pre-stripped pre for me. So I'll just go and uh, the hard part about. It's not even the hard part, but the main part about getting a new cord on is you have to get this uh, strain relief out. You just give it a pull, squeeze it with some pliers, and it pops out. And then it splits in two halves. And then you got your cord is free. So what I'll do is I'll go about replacing this cord. This one is a polarized one. And uh, I don't know if this was wired properly. Probably not. So uh, what I'll do is I'll just remove this. I'll keep this for working in, on extension cords where it belongs, not on stereo equipment. This is an old one, I guess. Some old stuff here. If you've never seen one of these plug-ins before, you can buy these at the hardware store for about five bucks. And they'll replace your broken end. I'll show you. You got your shell and then your headpiece. White is your neutral. Green is your ground and then your hot would be this one. So that one coincides. Yeah. If you look at a at an outlet, I don't have one here, but if you look at it, there's two blade slots for these. One's smaller than the other because the polarized plug won't fit in it. And your smaller one will be your hot. Usually it's on the right. Yeah, I think so. So This thing I think is unusual. You just have one screw and it tightens all three conductors at the same time. I think. I'll just loosen it off some more. Yeah, look at this. The guy had the insulation pinched in the uh, surprised it even worked. Wow. So he clamped down on the insulation and the copper didn't even get touched. This side was okay. So big fail there. We'll change this cord. So basically what you do is you remove the old one and you put the new one in the back in its place. But you have to also have the heat shrinking on the connections. Like the origin originals were all heat shrink to insulate. So we cut off the old uh, heat shrinking and desolder and then uh, what I like to do is I like to clean up the uh, the connections here so that um, the lug is, is, is open and free you can put the wire back through it because it has to be wrapped through the lug for safety reasons you can't just tack a wire on top of the, of the old one so you gotta remove the old wires and uh, see that lug's open now, so I can solder back to it. I had to remove this little fuse holder so that I can get at it. It's got a little uh, insulating sheet, and there's a cover, a little cover, and uh, goes over the little fuse holder like that. So that's what that does. So I'll get this back together. And um, what I need to do now is figure out which 
wire is the neutral, which is the hot. Every wire set that you look at will have two, like for example, two wires. One of them will be identified. Either it'll be identified by strike of paint, um, it might be a different color. This one here has a rib. You can feel it on the one conductor and the other side is, is smooth. Um, sometimes they'll have like a colored thread included with the copper. So when you peel a insulation off, there'll be a colored thread on one of them. That's another way they do it sometimes. Um, but they always have it identified somehow. And if you look at it, the new plug, where is my new plug? No, yeah, here it is. The identified wire is always your neutral. So if you look here, sorry, you got a polarized plug. The one with the skinny blades is your hot. The one with the wide blade is your neutral. And that's on the same side that this is, this wire has ribs on it on this side. So that's your identified wire. And that's your neutral. So you can remember that all the way, you don't even have to look at your plug, you know that it's a neutral because it's identified by either the paint striper or a, a ridge that's molded into the plastic. But I need to uh, figure out which, uh, which wire is hot. I think the hot goes to the fuse, but I'm going to check the schematic just to make sure. I have a schematic here somewhere. So once I got my wires fed in correctly, and I know there's no knots or tie tangled up. I, I go ahead and start wiring this. This gets fed through the hole and folded over. You have to make a mechanical joint as well as electrical. And I'll solder this up. Make sure it's well soldered, gets lots of heat. Okay. And then we sleeve it. And we're done. So I'll screw that back down and then we'll uh, continue on with the power switch. Okay, after you're done your soldering, last step is make sure there's enough slack in there. You don't want to have too much slack and you don't want to have not enough. Put the old strain relief on. I'd give it maybe about an inch. And then you gotta just squeeze it down with a pair of pliers. Squeeze it down and put it in. And then it's done. Perfect. And it's probably five and a half feet. But that's okay. That'll work good. And if you can see that. Can you see that screw? Here's another one. See how they're worn out? Looks like somebody's had these screws out a hundred times already. They're all rounded and they don't look very good at all. You see that they're all rounded and open. So somebody's had this front panel off a few times. I don't know. I don't know. I'm going to find out here. 
why those screws have been taken off so many times. They don't even look like the right ones. Same thing going on here. This screw here, for example. This one looks like it's, it's all mushroomed. And it's got sharp edges on it. Maybe somebody's been in here to change lamps, but I can't imagine it being that. can't imagine them having to go in that many times to change a lamp. So both of these bulbs are foobar. They do work when they feel like it. Come on. Oh, here we go. What I'm thinking I'm doing is getting rid of these uh, incandescents and putting um, some warm white LEDs in here. I'll go one from each side. It'll give it give it the same color. That'll remain the same, but yeah, I think it'd be a little more reliable. Okay, I got the incandescent lighting replaced with LEDs. What I had is a a 14 volt AC tap off the transformer come in here, and then I had four posts these uh, wire wrap posts. And what I did is I just built a little circuit right there. I had a, uh, I got a half wave rectification with a single diode and going into a 100 microfarad capacitor just so that it smooths out the the um, the strobing, the 60 hertz strobing from the, if I just, uh, you know, uh, used a, a diode with an LED, it's going to be on 50% of the time, then off 50% of the time because of the, the way it's rectified. So you add the capacitor in there, that smooths that all out and uh, gets rid of that uh, on, off, on, off uh, strobing that the, the LEDs have. And you can see that too. If you if you move your hand in front of it or something, you'll see your hand will, will uh, be strobed. But I, I got that all cleaned up. 900 ohm resistor to drop to a current from the um, the 19 volts that's being created by this little power supply and uh, the the LED LEDs I'm using are from a um, television I believe I'll show you what they look like it is a little chip LED and I mounted it to the to the board and electrically connected it, of course. And uh, there's two LED dies on this one chip, this uh, surface mount chip. So I got two LEDs here, two LEDs here. So there's four in total. They're all wired in series. And uh, the 900 ohm dropping resistor provides uh, approximately 10 milliamps for the LEDs, which should give these a uh, very long life. When I, uh, I did the test, I tested them out. They don't even get warm. They stay nice and cool. So these LEDs should last indefinitely. I'll put this back. Well, this is going to be difficult or what? As soon as the camera's rolling, things get hard. Yeah, I dropped it too. Never mind. But um, you can get an idea what it looks like. It does have a cold white light. And then I have um, a warm white LED in here. I replaced a little incandescent that was shoved in the hole. And I think that was an original LED um, incandescent, to tell you the truth, because the glue was all intact, holding it in. So I removed that uh, incandescent and I replaced it with a warm white LED. And I have that going back to the same 19 volt supply uh, through a 3.3K resistor to drop the current down to about four or five milliamps. And this one will stay cold as well, and it won't get hot. And everything should be 100%, looks good. There's no strobing. Um, yeah, it should last indefinitely now. All right, uh, I wanna get this wrapped up and get it off my bench. I got lots of other things to work on here. Um, I cleaned these uh, switches the best I could without removing them because 
The problem with this is I would have to remove the dial string. Uh, you know, there's probably there's quite a few things in the way, and these boards are sandwiched together. These switches are actually hidden between two sandwiches of uh, printed circuit boards. So what I did is I, um, with the front spraying in the front, I worked the switch probably about half an hour, and then it finally cleared up. And I went through each of these switches just to check to make sure, and uh, they're all clean now. I still have a little bit of scratchiness on the tone defeat button, but that's not a big deal for me. It's either going to be in or out. Um, solder joints, I cleaned up quite a few overall. Um, one of the problems I had is the soldering on this thing is not the greatest. Um, they left the leads untrimmed, you know, almost to the point where they're sticking out a quarter inch. So I had to go through and clip a lot of leads on the bottom because um, otherwise um, there's potential there for short circuits, right? So I wanted to clean that up. So I got it back together and I'm feeding tones through it and it's working good. I'll show you here. And uh, all the controls are clean. There's no scratchiness. Uh, everything's good, switches are good. And uh, it's working clean now. I got the amplifier aligned for the the bias setting and the DC offset. Those are dialed in now. They were uh, both out. Um, I had uh, 100 millivolts on one channel and about 60 on another. And the specification is uh, zero plus my 60 millivolts. So uh, they're not too concerned about 60 millivolts. Uh, neither am I, but you know, you try and get it as close to zero as possible. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to uh, turn on the dummy load, and we're going to do a power test on this. Uh, just give me a second, I'm going to fire up my other camera. Just stand by. All right, so you should uh, now be able to see my scope up at the corner. And I have this on speaker system two, which is my dummy load. I'm going to start turning up the volume. We'll take out the clipping. She's right, right there. And we are developing 17.96 volts RMS. Uh, for some reason I thought this amplifier was more powerful. And one channel clicked off. Get circuit breakers. I don't know uh, why that would click off unless I have a ground loop that's causing problems. Let me just wait and see how this goes. Well, it clicked off once and then it came back on and then it's staying. And the uh, channel that clicked off was the rate channel, I believe. So I'm just going to let this go for a while. We're still at 17.97 volts RMS. It's not getting overly hot. I don't know what the specification is on this amplifier. Clicked off again, right channel. We might have a weak circuit breaker on the right channel. It's back on again. So I'll let this cook for a while. 
and we'll see how it uh, fares out. Okay, so it's been on a while. The right channel keeps clicking on and off, and I think it's just a weak circuit breaker on that channel. The left is holding on. They're both developing the same amount of power. Um, I think the fault is within that circuit breaker. So uh, short of replacing that, which I don't have, I'm just gonna leave it alone. And uh, what I'll do is I'll just turn it down a bit. I'll give it the output. 15 volts RMS. I don't know how many watts that is off the top of my head, but I'll put it at around 15 volts RMS and I'll let it cook for a while and I'll see if that circuit breaker keeps acting up. It shouldn't, it should stop and be start behaving. So I'll just turn this up slowly and I got it pretty close right there. Nine. There we go. Tenth of a volt over. I'll just let that go for a while and we'll uh, see how that is. So just as I suspected the the circuit breaker stopped misbehaving and I turned it down a bit and uh, I think it's just a weak circuit breaker on that channel. So I'm going to close this up and we'll get the uh, front panel back on and then we'll give it another test on the tuner. So I was about to uh, video the closing sequence for this receiver because I got it all back together and it's functioning 100%. And then I noticed there was a little more, one more thing I forgot to, or didn't forget, but I overlooked it, I guess, is this LED doesn't work. It doesn't work very good. Here, I'll show you. Turn it on, and the tape monitor, if you can see that, it barely lights up. You can even barely see it. It doesn't even look like it's on compared to, you know, a regular functioning LED. So I'm going to go in there and replace that LED. I don't understand why it's so dim. If you can see that on the camera, but it's not working. So let's uh, let's go in and change that. I'll get back on that back to you in a minute. Okay, I think I finally got it figured out here. Uh, I replaced the LED. So in total, we put a new power cord on. Got rid of this lump of ugliness. Replaced a dead LED in the front panel for the tape monitor. Replaced a couple of capacitors in the power amp that were weak. And replaced two flaky bulbs with LEDs. I did an LED conversion on this thing. I went through and did a alignment on the amplifier and uh, cleaned it up. Sorry, cleaned it up. And I'm really, to tell you the truth, I'm really pleased with this receiver. This is pristine. Once I cleaned it up, it came back beautiful. And um, it has a bit of a problem when I power it up. Here, I'll show you. You can hear it when I hit the speakers. You hear that DC component on that? Uh, and I assure you, I set the, uh, the, the idling current and the DC offset. I set that up already. But... Um, when you first turn it on, you get a, a DC offset on the outputs. And um, now, I'm not concerned about it because once the amplifier warms up, that goes away. It'll uh, disappear. So let's have a listen. Oh, I need to hook up an antenna. Hang on. There we 
There we go. I'm getting full strength. The tuner's working good. It's a very weak station. Days with Stephanie Nicole. Nine Shine FM. Safe and fun for the whole family. I don't know if you can see that, but the LED's on now. It's working. And the tape monitor loop. So I'm really, um, I'm really happy with this receiver. I'm going to put this on my desk and I'm going to use it and give it a test drive, um, just to see how it performs. And uh, I think it's a nice unit. I wasn't pleased with the I wasn't pleased with the um, the bodges I found on the on the circuit boards. It seemed like the engineering department on this thing kind of rushed us, but uh, it it's a nice nice unit, nice clean unit. Pots. I didn't even clean the pots. They were still in uh, good condition. None of them are scratchy. So yeah, I'm going to wrap this up. All right, thanks for watching. And uh, stay tuned. I got lots more coming. I got lots of work on the way. I got lots of projects and repairs ongoing that I'm trying to get completed. This was one of them. I wanted to get this off my bench so I can get working on other stuff. But uh, yeah, thanks for watching and uh, hope you tune in again. See you later.